Hi, everybody. I've straightened my microphone out. Good, good morning. Um, what am I going to chat about today? You know, I have so much. I mean, we could go on for hours, but I want to focus on something that I think is important, and I hope this will be helpful for you today. Um, today, I'm going to begin with tools. I, I think it's helpful to provide you with tools that are practical and useful for you as we continue this journey into really the collective unknown. We, we're we sharing a most extraordinary time, and I, we can't take our eyes off the truth that this really is an extraordinary journey into the collective unknown together. There'll never be another time like this. And I know we want to say, wow, thank God for that. But, and that's true. But think about this. I mean, as we look back, and my reflections class will start next week, I'm really going to dive deep into the long preparation we've had for this time. And it has been a long preparation. And I, and I think that we become um, oblivious to the fact that all these past decades have been just that, a long preparation for a, a huge transformation, a huge transition from one way of being to another. And I, I don't think I'm really over-exaggerating the impact this is going to have on us. And it may be one of several ongoing changes that this is <clears throat> that this collective virus is activating. I don't think it's the beginning. I mean, I don't think it's the end. I think it's the beginning of the th dominoes and threads that are going to that are getting initiated. Let me say that. So I, what I want to start with is um, one tool I want to give you this morning is, and, and we're going to enter into this. I mentioned earlier that we had a download in the beginning, way back in the beginning, um, somewhere in the 60s, I think it was, 70s, that we create our own reality. And that is a high voltage mystical truth. There, that is a truth. But we have to examine it in microchip details. Exactly what is that truth? And how do we create our own reality? And why? Why was that truth downloaded into us? And how do we utilize that truth? The part of that that I want to heighten your awareness of today, because I think it's so important, is that the tool we have, the means through which we create our reality, it, are the words we use, words. Words are our tools. They are the tools that we use to sculpt the way we um, form our reality how we look at everything, how we shape the world we're in, how we respond to a situation, how we think about something, how we um, um, analyze something. Every word you, you, you think, every word you, you, you have available to yourself. One of the observations I had along the way when I was um, <clears throat> deeply enmeshed in healing and examining the question about why people don't heal, which eventually led to my looking at healing and looking then into wondering about miracles and wondering about healing at the mystical level, a track we're going to go through. Um, and these take, I'm going to slow it down. We, we have time now to slow that down and walk you through that journey. Um, is is the role the words in our head play. 
and how we talk about our world and how we talk about ourselves and how we talk to ourselves. And if you think about it, you are your closest companion. You're the one you have the most conversations with. You're the one you talk to the most. It, you don't talk to other people the most. You talk to yourself the most. That sounds annoying me. I hope it's not annoying you. I don't know what to do about that. Well, anyway, I'll get to that. Um, can, can I fix that? I, uh, anyway, you talk to yourself the most. How you talk to yourself, what you say to yourself, sculpts your interior reality more than you know. You have the, the words you use are your power chips in yourself, like, like um, what you put in your interior computer. When, you, when you're on a healing track, when, you, when you're coping with depression, when you're coping with an illness, the way you, the words you use impact every single part of yourself. What I realized is that a lot of people don't have the vocabulary to heal. They, they just don't have it. They get on a track of language that is like a hamster wheel. And they tell themselves the same narrative. They use a vocabulary that if I had my ch if I had a board behind me and I could stand up and teach in a classroom, oh, I can't wait to get back to a classroom, I would draw the chakras and I would say, look, vocabulary goes with chakras. And in the first chakra, you have very tribal vocabulary. And the second chakra, you have very um, monetary, you have very... Um, uh, relationship vocabulary, very controlling vocabulary. When you get to the third chakra, you have very possessive vocabulary. What's mine? And, and you have, and in that vocabulary, you hold on to experiences that you think only happen to you. And so you form, you have a vocabulary that matches that that matches that and you hold on to that and it's possessive and that and a possessive vocabulary possesses you it possesses you it 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 becomes a possession and so getting you to let go of experiences that have hurt you begin to hurt you again and again and again how you speak to yourself is then results in creating and recreating a, a, a reality. And this is where I'm going to begin to jump out of my seat. Why we need to learn that we create our own vocabulary and why we create our own reality is because we are that powerful is because every word we use packs a creative punch and getting us to release, to, to, to actually become conscious, conscious that that's what we're doing is exactly what consciousness is all about. To say, I can't use this word anymore because this word results in that. So now hold that thought, hold that thought. We're going to hit a pause button. And I want to tell you a story. I love stories, and you love stories, and it's story time. Years ago, I had dinner with friends of mine in um, uh, England, and it was um, a dinner with a group of wonderful Irish Catholics and nuns, nuns. And one was the abbess of this community. And she was telling a story in this great Irish accent <clears throat> and she, she, uh, is this not beautiful? Is that not the most gorgeous mug? And she was saying that she had gotten an email from a bishop. And just the thought of a bishop using email had me in hysterics. But the bishop had sent her an email asking all these questions. And so she fired back an email saying, 
um, give me some time to reflect on this. And this is the evening. This was the conversation that eventually gave birth to why I, that inspired why I called my class reflections. So this is how, this is what impressed me so much. The bishop fired back and said, I want an answer right away, which provoked her. And she said to him via email, you had time to reflect on what you wrote me. And I require as much time to give a reflective response because my, how I respond has an effect and an impact on a community of human beings. My answer, my words, how I phrase it, those words are attached to everyone I live with. We spent the evening talking about that, how our words are attached to everybody, to everybody. It was one of the richest conversations I have ever had in my life. That in fact, every word we say is, has consequences to the community of people with whom we live, and then even larger with the community of people with whom they live. That to speak without reflection is a very risky thing to do. It's a very risky thing to do. Because we set acts of creation in motion every single time. And if I reverse it, I want to say to you, think about the, that your wounds, when someone tells me about their wounds, they tell me about the words someone said to them, the words someone may have said to them without thinking. And how often in an apology someone has said, I didn't realize what I said. I didn't realize the impact that would have on you. A word. Sometimes it's just a word, just one word. So the power of your words, I, I, I want to give that to you as I use the next word that I'm going to give to you as one I want you to reflect upon. And now we're going to shift gears. When I finally got into healing, what I also realized is the limitations of the lower vocabulary that we use. That in fact, the, the words that we use in our minds, and by the way, I know I need a haircut, drop it. Um, the words we use in our minds, the mental level has only so much potency. It doesn't go very far. It, those words, words that belong to the realm of reason, will only bring us back to looking for reason. I need a reason why this happened. I need a reason. And it's in that vocabulary of reason that has promoted the brilliance of science. I need a reason for this, so I'll do research. I need a reason. I have to know how and why gravity works. I need to know this. I mean, these the reason is brilliant. We need reason. I need, I need to know why my light bulbs aren't working. I need reasons. My gate doesn't work. I need a reason to know that it doesn't work. And I need a reason, and I'm out there fiddling with it, and, and, and I need that. I really, I, I really, my gate isn't working. And it makes me unreasonable, and that's not something you want to see. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not the best person when I get unreasonable. And it's worse when I have no one to be unreasonable with. But that's not a healing vocabulary. That's the vocabulary that makes you imagine that there's an off-planet God you can reason with. I got to have reasons. I got to have reasons why things happen as I do. And then you pray that way. You pray for reasons. And one of the things you have to understand about, well, you don't have to, but I would give you this to sit with, is that we don't have a God of reasons. 
we have a God of miracles. We have a God of faith. The nature of God is fully and totally unreasonable. I think that's something people don't understand. They don't get that the nature of the divine, the nature of the invisible world is unreasonable. It doesn't have reasons why things happen as they do so far as we understand reason. Not at all. It has the nature of the divine is curious, mystical, miraculous, benevolent, and so right now you could think, oh yeah, look at this virus. <clears throat> no, 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 no. The nature of the divine works in a timeless kairos realm. It doesn't have the present moment only on its agenda. It works from a timeless sphere that is at its core, at its core, The mechanism are the laws of the universe, the law of balance, the law of cause and effect, the law of um, attraction, the law of the laws of creation. If you want to understand the nature of God, enter the laws of nature. And the laws of nature as they are in your nature, as they are in all nature. This is this what we are going through is the ending of the myths of God as an anthropomorphic creation and the birth of an understanding that we are a bio spiritual ecology where the laws of creation that we co create reality. This is what's awakening in us. And it awakens, all things awaken through eruption. It's erupting. It doesn't just dawn on us. It erupts because we have to co-create. Co-creation is not about I have to co-create and get what I want. Getting what I, we want awakens greed. And greed does this. Greed does this. We want to get more, 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 more. Life is not about getting more. It's about becoming conscious of the consequences that if I keep getting more, it's because I want someone to have less. And I'm afraid if they have more, I'll have less. That's what does this. Make no mistake. That's what does this. That's what does this. I want to give you a word. We go from mental language what I realized is that we need holy language. Mental language isn't, doesn't have the voltage. We need holy language. What's holy language? Holy language is the language of the soul. It has grace to it. It has potency. It's unreasonable. It carries light. It carries that quality of potency that moves within us in a life-giving way. It's the language of inner transformation. So I want to give you a word today that is pure grace, endurance, the grace of endurance, because we need to endure. Hi, everybody. I had a little bleep there, so you're going to see that I'm, I, I, whatever, I had a bleep. You, you've already noticed that I'm not, like, great with this, so you'll have to excuse me. Let's continue. I was talking to you about giving you a word that's a grace, and that holy language is the level at which words become a very different power tool. And the word I wanted to give you is endurance, and endurance as a grace. And that's the grace I think we need at this point. We need to endure this journey because we can't walk away from it. 
we can't make it go away. And there are going to be many moments, many days in the time ahead where we want to make it stop. And we don't have that power. There's no place we can run and hide. There's no place we can go. And human nature is such that we might become explosive. We might find that the impact of this, the loss of things, maybe the loss, the absence of our finances, perhaps, the absence of our routine, the close quarters with people that we prefer sometimes to have a break from, is going to give us, all of these are going to give us things to endure. And they have to endure us. Let's not forget, things are a two-way street. And we're the grace of endurance is that grace that has a calming effect. That, and sometimes even for five minutes. But five minutes is enough to transition to a different state of consciousness. The nature of grace is exactly that a transition. It takes you from one place to a better place, even a slightly better place. And so in saying, I need endurance and I need it now, I need that grace. Even that prayer is enough, is enough to have that grace come into you. And so that's, that's how holy language works. That's how a prayer works. It's like, I need that endurance and I need it now. And that, that is the grace I think that we need to tap into in these, um, in these days ahead. The grace of, there's many other graces we'll talk about, but today I think as we are transitioning to yet the end of another week and more people are going into quarantine or lockdown or shelter in place, whatever they want to call it, it doesn't change the fact that we're confined. And that's not the way we're used to living. And in that confinement, the outside world's going to change in other ways. And it makes, you know, it makes us feel like we're at the windows from the inside watching things happen that we can't change. It's also changing our, our inner authority. It's changing our political authority. It's changing our emotional authority. I mean, it's having subtle changes that we are not even discussing. And those, author- those changes are, are not even being felt, but they're happening. And they are happening. And they're, they're like homeopathic They've yet to come in, but they're going to come in. So endurance is something that we have to gird our loins and become stronger in a way that we have not yet even thought about. So we have to think about that. And this is where wiring ourselves to a greater community, to a greater network, realizing that some that there are experiences in life that require the strength of others that we really can't get through it alone wars are things like that catastrophes are things like that you can't get through it alone you just can't you cannot bear to think i'm the only one going through this you cannot endure it alone this is that experience for us we cannot get through this alone. We must, we must be in this together. And that's where praying together comes in. At least if we know that we are praying with each other, sitting with each other, joining our souls together with each other at three o'clock, we are using our power to co-create a different world, to pour grace into it. We can endure. 
the journey, even if it's day by day. We can do this. We can. We can because we, we have to. We're the ones here at this time, and that's not an accident. When you, when you think, you know, when someone says, well, I'm, I'm here, I knew I, ha I was born for a greater purpose. All right, then. Use that greater purpose. It's never been an occupation, you know. Greater purpose is a soul's calling. So call your soul. So I'm going to end on a prayer. Um, oh, by the way, I finished my book yesterday on prayer, so I hope it'll be published soon. All right, close your eyes. Yeah, I don't know if you really close your eyes, but uh, here's a prayer. I was asked again how you work, Lord, and does prayer really do any good? And I have to tell you that sometimes I wish you would show up and answer that question for yourself. It's exasperating. I have so much proof and yet no way to prove that you do. How do I explain how you work when I hardly understand it myself? What can possibly explain divine intervention? And yet I've had so many experiences of mystical encounters with heaven. What do I tell others? These encounters between you and me happen, and that's the mystery of it all. You never leave any obvious evidence in your wake, only the type that requires faith. I realized quite some time ago that words are useless when it comes to explaining you. Perhaps you should be part of the ocean again, perhaps another Moses routine. But even if you did... I know how many human beings would respond. We would, I know how human beings would respond. We'd find a scientific reason for why that happened. You would fade again into the background. Science in you, not good bedfellows. And yet the physicists are now floating around in mystical territory, studying light and energy. I imagine they'll run into you soon enough, likely through an anomaly that defies their calculations, but not yours. For you reside within anomalies, always hiding in the unexplainable. So what should I tell people when they ask if praying to you does any good? I've asked some people to tell me why they're asking that question in the first place. I already know the answer, but it is they who need to admit it. They've progressed beyond mere problems and are now dealing with the type of suffering that comes from beyond ordinary options. Finally, they must consider if divine intervention is really possible. I often tell people that they've nothing to lose by praying. Praying never harmed anybody. I tell them that, but deep down, I know without a doubt that you will respond to them with an outpouring of grace. You will flood them with holy light from the celestial realm. Would that they could only see it. Even science would find it difficult to explain such light piercing through the sky like a laser. And all that opening, and all it takes to open this floodgate is one prayer. You amaze me. Okay then. Sorry for the blip. I'll see you soon, probably tomorrow. Bless you all.